Good evening. Welcome to the inaugural lecture of the spring semester. My name is Gary Page. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing the spring lecture series titled Differentiated Topographies. Before I do, however, I'd like to recount a small bit of history about the Wednesday night lecture series. It was started in 1972, coinciding with the founding of the school, as a public forum to present work and discuss ideas. In the beginning, it was organized and run almost entirely by Ray and Shelley Cappy, the school's founders. Under Michael Rotundi's tenure, the evening lecture series continued to grow and evolve, becoming a collaborative project between the director, students, faculty, staff, and program heads. Each fall, the series is organized by the first year graduate class, and in the spring, by a class of undergraduate students. Today, the series continues to foster debate within the school and community by examining the ideas and conditions under which cultural production, architecture, of course, is a characteristic form, takes place. Tonight, I'd like to recognize and acknowledge some of the folks that, through their combined efforts, produced this series. Group of undergraduate students, Israel Kandarian, Brian Hajar, Simon Demuse, Jeffrey Chan, their faculty advisor and my colleague and co-teacher, Sharon Johnston, and our dedicated and indefatigable publications coordinator, Margie Reeves. Please give them a hand. Now, a brief note on the series, Differentiated Topographies. This series began with a set of questions concerning the topic of extended territories and field conditions. In a general sense, the endeavor is to examine the ideas and conditions that have given rise to various forms and trajectories of cultural production. How is culture defined and construed today? What shapes does it assume? What are some of the zones where discourse is generated and produced? And how do these practices intersect and recombine to produce an emergent field of possible architectures? These are a few of the questions that we'll be asking. In a specific sense, our, our interest is interrogating the term field, using it as a point of departure for inquiry. Within this context, field, field theory, field conditions is multivalent, simultaneously referring to a region of space in which a force operates as an electromagnetic field or discursive field to a sphere of activity or set of practices, Rosalind Krauss's idea of an expanded field or John Holland's terrain of emergent phenomena, to a topological surface expanse or landscape, a discrete object's other. We'll look at various practices speculating on the changing shape of society, the shift taking place from a service-based economy to an information economy, and how it affects the education of the architect and practice of architecture. From multimedia and website design to engineering, spatial politics to landscape architecture, the idea of cultural space is a discursive field, formal, social, urban, political, representational, and historical will offer a context for discussion and debate. This evening, I have the pleasure of introducing a partnership, Post-Tool Design, doing some of the most innovative and compelling work in one of those extended territories, multimedia. Founded in 1993, their work encompasses illustration, print graphics, animation, motion graphics, interactive media, web development, programming, and sound design. Their clients include America Online, Apple Computers, Autodesk, Chiat Day, and many others too numerous to mention within the confines of this brief introduction. Their work has received awards and special mention for artistic achievement. It's been published in all of the notable graphic and communication art journals, and is in the design collection for interactive and web work at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Post-tool design is Gigi Biederman and David Karam. Their work specializes in the strange and beautiful. Please join me in welcoming Post-Tool Design to SciArc. Thank you for inviting us to be the first speakers in your lecture series. Um, 
what we wanted to do is just give you sort of an outline of what we wanted to present to you tonight. Um, the f we wanted to speak directly to the topic, um, differentiated topographies and what we felt that meant and as graphic designers, what that would mean speaking to architects, students, and architects. Um, so we put together a video that is really meant to be thought of as a slide presentation that is kind of a, a moving slide presentation. So uh, we'll begin with that and then hopefully that would provide some kind of background about us and our thinking in terms of the work that we make. And then we wanted to look at specific projects and those will be multimedia CD-ROM projects. So if we could start the slide video. Oh, Keith, thank you, Keith, too, for all of the gymnastics, getting all of this equipment together. Words come from a need to express ideas and describe things. A vessel is a story, and its form is a reference to a concept or memory. A word has a sound and form which have meaning, which is interpreted in context. We associate. Associations are formed intuitively, and abstractions are fused as links. Properties that accompany the physical world exist as constants that we accept and assume. A building is by its nature a structure. There is an explicit physical hierarchy that delivers the narrative of that space. Personal expression finds voice through color choices in landscaping. How we divide the space divide, describes its use. Language within specialized fields defines an inner circle. Language often functions as a code. As graphic designers, we often think of ourselves as information organizers. The structure we build, the structures we build are based on word, image, or semiotic. The meaning that emerges from the linking of word and image is based on our nature to associate and connect. Words are not usually meaningful in isolation, but only when they appear in a sentence with other words or in a specific environment. An excerpt from a recent project discusses this idea more poetically. Language often has as much to do with architecture as with communication. We cement word bricks together to build sentence rooms and connect them to secret passages concealed behind idioms and metaphors. But slowly our intentions rise against the skyline. Within every interaction, we're presented with infinite stimulus washing over our senses. Through the, through the distractions, we filter meaning by tuning to resonant connection. How one listens at any moment is a result of cumulative individual culture and links to language conventions. How may I be of service? 
Here you are safe, welcome. Here your well-being is in my care. Thank you. Let me tell you what I have in mind. The convergence of sound, image, text, and motion, coupled with interactivity or two-way communication, distinguishes interactive media. How the computer is regarded is shaped by its use. The properties within the virtual environment are endlessly transmutable. Information is free from the constraints that natural laws imply. Virtual environments allow us to explore unrealistic scenarios. A door points to a room which is physically across the globe. The representation of a physical object may be captured, distorted, and remanufactured. Organizational models move from linear and hierarchical to symbolic. We relate the movement and behaviors of objects on screen to physical models. Images might take the properties of gravity and mass, attracting each other based on their poetic associations. A word might burn and produce smoke, a fleeting message. We see the computer as an iterative engine displaying an infinite number of images. It is able to produce a multitude of solutions for every problem, much like the mind. We develop programs that automatically generate spatial arrangements of information. We feed this engine a series of elements and layout rules, and it arranges the information. Meaning is a byproduct. We use agents to act as guides to the virtual environment. They suggest the screen is a, win a window onto another world. Essentially, the computer is a database. Everything from Word to Photoshop to Form Z is based on this convention. It is key to all computer operation. A database is like memory. Its own internal code is like the language we use. A database is linear, hierarchical, and associative, and user interfaces allows us to have a dialogue with the system. The designer, the architect, the mathematician all produce signs which link ideas and produce dialogue. Conversation is structure, and the best structures come when we abstract and associate sound, vision, and ideas. We lose the boundaries between conceptual space and the real city, the narrative and its structure. It is interesting to think about the objectness of the computer, its physical presence. We often overlook that aspect moving directly into the virtual environment. Flat screens and projections are significant. They help us to suspend our belief, acting as a threshold onto another environment. When we encounter a computer in a public forum, in a museum for instance, we expect some kind of interactive or multimedia experience. When we strip the computer of any interactive device and are left only with a monitor, the subtext points to a one-way communication, a screen, a viewing device, a relative of the television. As designers working with technology, we want our solutions to grow organically. Understanding the computer as a database has shaped the way we design interactive experience. Questioning its role socially, visually, psychologically has led us to explore the intersections of inside and outside. created for the Lim Gallery in San Francisco for a show that was installations of multimedia artwork. Our interest was 
putting a computer in a gallery space and uh, considering what that presence has as a work of art. So we removed the keyboard, removed the mouse, and tried to present the computer as something to regard or mesmerize, much like a piece of artwork. So this looping video was really just meant to capture your attention, hold your gaze. But I think the interesting, the interesting thing is this strange, we see the computer, we feel we have to interact with it. Um, so David's going to go upstairs and we're going to start kind of a ventriloquist performance where he's going to work the computer and I'm going to speak. Um, so this is sort of the second part of our discussion tonight where we wanted to look more at specific projects and show then some of our theories in practice. <laughs> So. Oh. <laughs> How's it huh? Hold Where are you? Hold on there. This was it intelligible? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was a little, uh, I was in a bad spot. To actually oh, hear we can hear you up there, David. Okay, so the first project that we're going to look at was for the Body Shop International, and the client came to us with some very loose ideas. They had some internal issues and they were going to have this large conference in Barcelona. They wanted to bring all of the franchisees, which there are over 200, and there are 21 different language bases they're dealing with, and they wanted to emphasize two things. One was listening, and the other was cultural sensitivity. And that was basically it, as far as the information they gave us, other than we want something modern, we want something on a CD, we're sick of video. So we created an interactive CD-ROM that would be distributed that functioned in 21 languages. And its whole purpose was to promote listening but it went through a spectrum, um, considering the idea that we're surrounded, surrounded by stimulus, and it's our role to tune out uh, or tune into meaning. So this piece is structured in five. We sort of were influenced by the spectrum, the idea of the spectrum moving from x-rays into visible spectrum to uh, cosmic rays, ultimately. It's meant to take the user's time and for them to decipher meaning, find meaning. Every place in the place in the world welcomes visitors in a different way. Here they ask you to take off your shoes, and there someone offers you one of his wives. 
In the desert, they roll out a carpet, and in the jungle, they pass around a gourd full of palm wine. In the old world, they offer up prayers to your ancestors, and in the new world, they give you the chair closest to the television. They will say shalom or salam, reach out the palm of their hand, or now kids got service. <laughs> إلى كافة جوانب الإنسانية عندما تكون الخدمة غير طوعية فإنها تصبح شبيهة العبودية أو العمالة القسرية أو الخدمة دون ابتسامة وعندما تتم تصبح دليلة ومحبوبة في السخرية إن الخدمة التي نصبح إلى توفيرها للمساكر أو العميل أو الزبون تتمنى التاريخ طويل فقد بنى الروم امبراطوريتهم بالاعتماد على العبيد وعند تحرير العبيد من مقالع المرمر انتقلوا الى الزراعه ليصبحوا عبيد الارض وهو نوع من الارتقاء كما نعتقد وقد فكر شخص في زمان اكثر انفتاحا بدق The 天的或是圆的。对。有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一天，有一
It houses both our portfolio of work from, I think, 1993 to 1998, and then, um, then there's a series of experiments that we'll move to afterwards. So the first project that we're going to show is called Questions and Answers, and it's actually the very first interactive piece that we ever made. So it's kind of interesting to look at, since there's no sophistication at all in terms of the programming. There is no programming. It's the simplest director work you can do. Um, the content was based on a little newsletter that a 13-year-old girl I babysat for had made. And it's basically strange facts about animals. Well, not all animals. So that was the branch of the interactive piece, we thought. It's really interesting to show how you got through all this. <laughs> this is a piece designed for floppy disk. So the next project we wanted to show is a, <clears throat> it's, I don't know how to call it, it's a piece for a photojournalist. So it's a story on disk, essentially. Cool. <clears throat> Excuse me. Saigon on Wheels. And he's a photographer. The interface, in many ways, is based on the shutter of the camera and coming into focus. So at any point, if any of the information is obscured, you click on that, and that's what comes into focus. This one, you could turn the sound on. So go ahead and show the menu. This is the help screen, but I think it's pretty. <laughs> okay. So the next project we wanted to show was a piece we did for Warner Records for the band Lush, part of their promotional package. Uh, this one was a piece where the graphics were entirely provided by Von Oliver. So we were just trying to respond to the music and create an experience that was emotive, uh, based on sound and movement, and questioning the role of the monitor what it was, and some of the movement we felt revealed this viewfinder quality. You had very limited control over the cast, the caster, which is the mouse. It has its own momentum, so you can try and steer it, but it floats off by itself. And we felt like that heightened this trippy quality to the music. Hypocrite. So the last piece in this section we wanted to show was, is for a 
for Gravity, a band, and this, this is a floppy disk single. <laughs> so it's just it's thinking of the computer as a keyboard for image and sound, and your movements create a disturbance in the image or the sound. So you become the composer both visually and audi audially. Is that a word? Okay. So, uh, and it's interesting, all the imagery was random. All the text was random downloads from the internet as, as the imagery was. And if anything was obscured, you could just drag it in. So we, we really didn't take any responsibility for the imagery that was on there. We just were thinking of it as almost a placeholder that you could constantly be changing the layout. This was our very first doodle program. So we've gotten more sophisticated, but you clicked on the Hope Diamond and you doodled and random bits of poetry came up. And it was for a, a friend, really, who has a band and he was able to send this out as a promotion for his, his music. to experiments, I think we started to realize that it was more fun to make than to watch. So we created this portion of our portfolio, which just allowed the user to play, make stuff. And it's filled with just stock post-tool imagery. So you are confined to having to doodle with, with post tool stuff. The devil is he comes and erases things, you can't control him. <laughs> This is it's kind of a one-on-one -on -one piece, but um, oh. everything's gone. <laughs> okay. So, the final dimension to this is that you could talk to the computer, so just by typing in a, a question, the computer would answer you, and it was set up so that your questions would be scrambled, so they could be anonymous, and then the answer would be for you specifically. So, I don't know if anyone in the audience has a question they would like to ask the computer. Now is your time. <laughs> well, why don't we just ask the computer if it's cold. I'm having trouble reading. I think it's too light. Can anybody see the responses? It's the uh, contrast is too light. Anyway, so in order to in order to quit the program, you have to you can either just quit or you have to say goodbye. <laughs> goodbye to the computer.
Okay. So. So that wraps up our visuals. Um, and I guess what we wanted to do was just open the floor up to discussion. Is it, I'm sorry? How are decisions made within the a lot, of, A lot of the decisions that we make in designing our object-oriented code are based on properties that we assign to any given object. We'll just decide this object has this property. What does it say? Like there was a property called Doric that's like a timeout property that I always forgot to debug. Thank you. Yeah. Are you speaking about um, for their multimedia presentations or? Well, okay, we're supposed to restate questions. So the question was asked, how do we, how do we, what advice can we give to, to get away from clutter, I guess, in presentations? And I would say, you know, don't, don't think anything is precious. Edit, edit completely and wholeheartedly and uh, you know realize that that if you're making a digital thing the the duplicated aspects of it are kind of inherent to it you can make multiple versions of the same thing and um, you know evaluate them I mean I think but the number one thing I think is don't have any don't hold on to things just because you made them yeah that but also I think focusing on what what in the end should the experience be? So if the experience is about getting a sense of space or moving through a space or any of these general ideas, that would be where I would focus, especially in this medium, is what is the experience? What do I want the viewer to come away with? We go too fast. Are we like done? <laughs> <laughs> too early? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you don't seem to take the notion that there's any copyright laws in it. I see a lot of uh, people from different areas coming to your um, Not so much anymore. Okay. Um, there, there was that one piece that I said was all random downloads. That was an early piece that I don't think they even had any laws yet. So it, it, it was an interesting time because I, I kept waiting for that, you know, there would be some kind of statement. But n we make everything that we use these days, it, be it film or animation. Well, and also that piece was, that piece is, it was non-commercial, it was for a friend, it was more like a collaboration. And, and the, 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 the experiment there was to kind of figure out how collage um, or, you know, related to digital media, not in the traditional sense of just compositing different things together, but when collage began, it was kind of this appropriation of these du duplicated elements that were just part of culture. And, you know, I mean, we have the same issues. I mean, I was just, we were kind of fooling around with the same issues from like, you know, taking magazines and newspapers and pasting them together to just taking stuff from AOL and pasting it together. And it seemed to fit the mood. the mood. The song had this kind of docudrama uh, 
like kind of uh, sensationalized news. And so that was a response to the song. And so it was subject based, I'd say. But everything else you've, you've seen has been stuff we've created. And especially since we've been getting into the, the 3D lately, it kind of has given us a lot of a depth to the imagery that we can create. When we started our firm, we were in a building actually called Post Tool, and they were a tool store. But we thought it made a lot more sense for us to be Post Tool. So we became Post Tool Design. And there was an early time where we stole all of our imagery from outdated textbooks, and that seemed to go in line with the appropriation of our name, that we would appropriate imagery. And we would appropriate everything, but we've evolved, I guess. <laughs> yes? What do you see the future now that the internet is kind of becoming a mainstream medium? What are you doing? Is it interactive television? Is it yeah, definitely interactive television. And I think for us, it's very exciting because we see the web finally being able to do what some of this multimedia presentations could do. So the bandwidth gets higher, wider. The image movement, the ability to interact becomes greater. So all of those things make it more exciting or more interesting as designers. Um, I think you know, I love getting online and seeing 13-year-old girl from Montana's web page, you know, so then there's that question whether there's still going to be the opportunity for everyone to be a celebrity online. You had a question over there? The body shop. The time frame? The, the Body Shop project that we did spanned three months, and we made projects in print, video, CD, and web. Um, there, were a group, there was a group of about 10 of us, and uh, we all had different kind of, we all had different roles that we played. There was the, the language speakers. It, I mean, but I'd say we finished, we, we spent about a month uh, kind of thinking about it and working with the writer who is a design historian and uh, then we've probably spent another month collecting imagery and, um, and we probably spent a couple weeks figuring out uh, technical aspects and then we probably spent a couple weeks finishing imagery, finding more imagery to fill spaces, recordings. I mean, actually there's like five hours of, of audio that took us a number of weeks to record on and off. I guess I felt that that particular project seemed the most relevant to this lecture when you're talking about fields or differentiated topographies and what that could possibly mean. It seemed to apply pretty well to that project since it, it really divided space, tried to break down uh, information and look at different areas towards creating one specific um, idea, which was this listening, listening right. to we, communication. We were actually approached by our client on this to just communicate the idea that uh, the people who work in body shop stores should listen to customers. And that was pretty much his big creative brief. And, um, we were supposed to create some cool CD-ROM because they were into technology. So um, with that kind of open I, fr you know, framework for the, pro for the project, we, we started thinking about, well, what do you do when you listen? Well, half the time you're just kind of like in, you know, in your own space. And so we divided it into those five areas. And that was, that was a great thing. I mean, we, we, it's not often that somebody comes to us with that loose of a project and lets us produce the entire thing. But I think for us, we, we use the opportunity to learn a lot of things. We had never done anything with, uh, with video, and so we, we Gigi got a, a DV camera 
and uh, we just started filming like crazy, and we worked with a, a couple of uh, old students of ours who started working on this project too, and I think we uh, learned a lot about video. I think it's interesting to look at it now because some of the, you know, as, we, as we've gone on to work more with, with filmed imagery, we're starting to actually develop an opinion about it, whereas I think at that time we were kind of, we were influenced a lot by things we had seen and trying to reproduce some aspects of that to communicate the message. And so there are some aspects of it I think that are um, maybe a little sterile, but I think overall we did, we had a good process on that for developing the piece. Yeah. Perhaps just talk a little bit about what your backgrounds were before you started doing multimedia, and it, it, it's curious to me because because the the, the, the kind of range of disciplines that you have to do from sound to, uh, to kinetic images to static images to everything else that's involved. I'm, I'm wondering what maybe was hardest for you to deal with, hmm. or what you were least expert in, and okay. how. Um, our backgrounds are very yin-yang. David is a pro was a programmer at university and a music major. I have a background in art history and fine arts. We met at California College of Arts and Crafts where we both are now professors. And when we started Post Tool, it wasn't really a multimedia company at that time. It was, we had done a lot of print work and David had been dabbling in director. And to answer your question of what was the most difficult, for me, the most difficult part was nonlinear media because I'm very linear and I found it difficult to think about simultaneousness, which a lot of David's thinking tends to be <laughs> <laughs> like that, and the media really lends itself to branching and choice-driven. Um, so I developed an ability to start thinking that way that was not natural for me. <laughs> you want to answer that question? Oh, uh, I don't. I I uh, I don't know. I mean, I think I don't. I don't really see it as. Uh, Necessarily difficult. I mean, Gigi, Gigi says all the time that she is, you know, not. And it's funny because you know, I mean, you can't call anybody an expert in this. You're, everybody's just kind of a dabbler in this stuff because it's so new. And I think that that's one of the things that we uh, ride on a lot. I enjoy that. I think it's the most entertaining aspect of what we do. If we had an opportunity to learn some new thing in every project, I think we would both be into doing that. And um, I think that kind of drives a lot of our decision making. I think, I mean, personally difficult, I have a difficulty not being ultra horsey, but that's where Gigi comes in. Ultra horsey. Hol horsey, big, like no, uh, I just like big stuff. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, you know, I tend, I tend to set type really big. I'm trying to do that two point designer thing. but. Um, I, I mean, it's funny, I, we both teach classes and we were talking about this tonight and when students walk into our class, we're both, we're both kind of um, anti-design in some ways. We both kind of give them, we both give the students the idea that uh, they don't have to use these really formal vocabularies to express ideas and that a lot of the ideas that you have that you can express are kind of things that you know really well and are comfortable with. Um, I mean, we've all watched enough TV to know how to make something better than a sitcom. Um. Sorry. <laughs> yeah? Gigi and I are in business despite ourselves. Um, we, we teach at school, so we have a lot of students who hang around. I don't know, we've never been real serious management types, but we're trying to learn how to be more of a business. Um, things happen very organically. I'd say both of our employees who do graphics for us right now kind of 
we didn't, we, I mean, we have stacks of resumes, but they kind of, I think people selected us somehow. I don't think it was a real super conscious decision. But I think, um, I think it's an interesting question to ask what, what are we looking for in this, what's most useful to us? And I wish that we had somebody who just loved to do programming and production. <laughs> because everybody wants to be a designer and, and we come across really talented designers and want to work with them. But it's, the hard part is finding the production people. But I think, I mean, the funny thing is what Gigi's describing is not the, the, the position that she's describing doesn't really exist in a lot of people, which is somebody who is not, I mean, there are a lot of programmers and, and most of the time a programmer will tell you that something d can't be done or they'll listen to you and say, uh-huh, 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 and then like lay it out completely differently. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things that, I mean, this is where I come in, I kind of, I have a little bit of a bridge between, I mean, I'm a hack programmer, I'm a hack designer, so I can kind of bridge those worlds, but it's not, I don't think it's so frequent that we find people who bridge right. that to yeah. think visually and systematically. Yeah. I mean, a large part of why we do what we do is due to the fact that David does cross over from the land of science to the land of art and through this medium. And I'm probably would have been more comfortable in, t in print and maybe video but I don't know that I would have taken on the programming of multimedia interactive work. I think that relates back to the question about how do you make a good piece. Um, a, lot of our work com a lot of our work that actually turns out okay comes from us being critical of each other, and I think Gigi and I have a good way of editing what the other does to kind of make it uh, I mean, I, I was about to say, like, no nonsense, but I don't think that's at all true about our work. Uh, we, I mean, it just becomes distilled in some ways, um, and whatever that means to us, we are good at kind of editing each other. And so I think, you know, if you're making stuff and you, uh, you can pair with a person who's kind of a complement, that always helps to make work strong. Anybody else?